Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I think a couple more people show up late. But, um, so it's my pleasure to have Jeff Pierce here today. Um, I've actually known Jeff for gosh, probably 10 years now. Um, we actually overlapped in uh, graduate school. So we have similar scars on our backs from the same advisor. Um, Jeff's currently a faculty member at Georgia Tech. Um, he's been doing some very interesting work with uh, distributed information environments. Uh, so he'll be telling us about some of that work. Thanks, Ken. Thank you guys for having me. I'll apologize in advance. So it's now about 4.30 on a Friday, which means my brain is going to check out in 30 minutes. So <laughs> if you have an interesting questions, ask them up front. Because if you ask them at the end, I'm, I'm going to be gone. So you're warned in advance. Um, so the stuff I'm going to talk about today is some of the stuff my research group has been doing, thinking about sort of this move from personal computers to personal information environments. So let me start off a little bit by saying what I mean by that. Um, and I'll also apologize. I have the faculty member's habit of pacing. So it'll keep you guys awake as you watch me go from one side to the other. If I wander to the back, you know, that's to make sure the students are paying attention and not reading email. I will occasionally, hmm, and I'll gaze off into space, and I'll go, uh, that's less than just an exercise to the reader. Um, will there be a quiz at the end? There will, as a matter of fact, that's right. Uh, I'll be grading you folks, don't worry about it, there's a curve. Uh, so, if you think about the way a lot of, of HCI focuses on designing interfaces, there's sort of this implicit model that the user is working with a single personal computer. Okay, and a lot of this is sort of based on this underlying assumption we have that computers are expensive. Back in my day, we had one computer on our desk, and we were grateful. Um, <laughs> but as prices drop, you know, sort of the, the model there changes a little bit. And so, you know, you're all familiar with sort of the common incarnations here, desktops. Laptops these days are actually sort of outselling desktops because they've gotten more powerful. Uh, and also sort of the price on them is dropping as well. But users are sort of starting to move away from this model of interacting with a single device. Okay. Instead, they're sort of moving toward this, this uh, state of working with multiple heterogeneous devices. So I myself have a desktop at home. I've got a Mac laptop, Windows laptop, Windows tablet, PDA, and cell phone, all of which I more or less use regularly. Um, and I'm actually kind of curious. So you guys quickly count up in your heads the number of devices that you work with regularly. It doesn't have to be devices that you own. You can count work devices, too. Okay. Let's so take a quick moment to tally. OK, two or more. If you run out of hands, that's fine. Two or more. Three or more. Four or more. Five or more. Six or more. Seven or more? Eight or more? Can you suck special notation? Yeah, okay. So the, the average at George Tech gets you curious among faculty and students is somewhere around 4.3. Okay. I gave up. I, uh, I don't have all day here. They only gave me an hour slot, so I kind of stopped at some point. Um, so the average at George Tech is around 4.3. I mean, if you figure cell phone plus desktop at work plus desktop at home, you're already at three. Okay, and then you throw in a laptop and you got four. So. Um, if you sort of think about it, the large part of this is sort of driven by computers are becoming much more inexpensive. I mean, your cell phone is a computer these days. Uh, I didn't even ask you guys to count things like the, the computers and your anti-lock brakes. Okay, we're focusing more traditional devices here right now. Uh, and so you can sort of think about this world where people can instead move toward focusing on the device they want, the task they want to accomplish. Okay, my tablet is great for, for taking notes. I'm going to grab that today. I want to write some email. I'm going to get my laptop because I like the keyboard on it. So to give you an idea of, sort of, uh, of the sort of first steps we're seeing now around Georgia Tech, at least, I grab my camera. Uh, and this is actually around over the summer. So a lot of the students are already away. And so this is sort of already drawing from a small subset of users. And I wandered around with my camera for 15 minutes uh, and over two floors of a building only. So I didn't even try very hard. Um, and I just grabbed a bunch of these pictures. Um, my office is actually the one right here. So I typically have laptop external display, tablet, and then Mac laptop. I actually really enjoy this one here. Uh, this is in the robotics lab, and so it's a bunch of students working on robotics projects. They all have desktops and laptops. These two guys here, they actually don't have enough desk space to put their laptops up, and so they're working on their desktops with their laptops on their laps. But they want both devices enough they're willing to put up with it. Um, I presume they have some sort of insulating pad to prevent their laps from being too hot or something. Um, so when my research group sort of talks about what we think about as the ingredients of a personal information environment, we focus on a couple of factors. So first, we focus on a particular user. So we're interested in supporting an individual. We're not interested in sort of, of augmenting spaces. There's a bunch of other research groups that are sort of focusing on you know, meeting rooms where you can bring devices in and, and combine different things. 
we're focusing on supporting the user as he moves about the environment and allowing them to draw on things like omitting meeting rooms, but also drawing on things like you know, multiple of their own devices in their own office. Okay. So we talk about the user's personal devices, so conventional stuff today like desktops, laptops, tablets. Um, we also think a little bit about sort of next generation stuff as well. Eventually you can imagine bringing your car into the loop as well, or your house. Um, we actually had some students play a little bit with um, bringing your clock into a personal information environment. What sort of crazy things can you do then? Uh, the other part of it we talk about is taking advantage of public devices. So as we wander about the world more and more, we encounter desktops and projectors and other sorts of input and output devices. How can we allow users to take advantage of those sorts of resources as well? So if we sort of recognize the fact that people are making this transition from working with a single computer to working across these different heterogeneous devices, it raises a number of opportunities and challenges. I'm not going to talk about all of them today. I'm going to focus on a particular pair. In particular, how can we allow users to leverage the different input and output resources that are available while addressing the resulting privacy and security challenges? Okay, that's the issue I'm going to focus on primarily in my talk today. So we coined this phrase a while ago about this idea of sort of, of opportunistic annexing. The idea of being able to uh, expand the IO resources you have by taking advantage of what's around you and annexing it to your devices. Okay, so we include both your personal stuff here as well as the devices that you encounter. And, you know, being eggheads, we sat, sat around with our feet up on our desks thinking about, oh, what sort of, of potential uh, theoretical advantages could we come up with for, the Andy, I'm just my beard. Uh, could we come up with for these sorts of, of applications and environments? And we sort of divided it into two groups. We thought about, okay, for your personal devices, we could do some things like, well, okay, instead of multiple monitors attached to a single computer, maybe we could have multiple monitors attached to multiple computers and provide some of the same advantages. Or maybe we could take advantage of specialized input and output. So I have some artist friends who love tablets because they can use the stylus for input. They hate doing the mouse to draw stuff. But tablets tend to have fairly small screens. So can you draw some stuff on your tablet and zoom in and see the details, but zoom out and show the overview on a desktop nearby so you can simultaneously edit details and then assess the impact? Um, you can also do things like, can you transfer information from your large display, which people nearby can see, to your small PDA to keep some more information private based on the size of the device and the ease of other people seeing it? For devices of the environment, we talk primarily about the idea of improving interaction. So as I wander about the world with my cell phone, which in the future has gigabytes of information, can I take advantage of nearby resources to improve the interaction? Okay, the CPU, the storage, the network on these devices will all improve. Arguably, the I.O. is going to remain limited because I have to be able to slip it into my pocket. Once I can no longer fit my cell phone in here, I'm going to stop carrying around with me at all times. Um, so we talked about things like, well, can I wander around and read email on my cell phone? So, you know, I'm in the airport, I want to catch up on some mail. You know, I might transfer the whole inbox and read things. I might transfer just parts. So if I don't want the kid next to me reading my Viagra spam, you know, I can choose just transfer messages individually. Um, so you can address some interesting privacy and security issues as there, uh, there as well by balancing the interface across devices. Okay. So once we were done with our egghead theorizing, we sort of sat back and said, well, okay, that's very interesting, but if we build it, will they come? Do people actually care about this? Sounds good, but, you know, do people want to use it? And so the approach we came up with for trying to answer that was to gather a bunch of folks. So we grabbed 18 users, 13 men, 5 women, primarily in their 20s and 30s. Um, five of them were academics, 13 were professionals. We focused on gathering people who tended to travel fairly often because we thought they were folks who might see the benefits of being able to divide their interfaces across these multiple devices. And we gave them a number of tasks divided across four applications. Okay, so email, calendar, uh, spreadsheet where you're doing an expense report and using a web browser to purchase something. For email, we asked them to check their inbox and read a couple of messages, and then to take a message that had flight information and forward it onto a colleague who was going to pick them up from the airport. For their calendar, we asked them to log into an online calendar. We used Yahoo Calendar as our example. Uh, view their daily schedule to find an appointment and then add an appointment in that was a doctor's appointment. Uh, for the spreadsheet, basically it was an expense report. They had to enter in some trip receipts. And for the last one, the online purchase, they were either on or planning their vacation and they wanted to buy some tickets to see the Tower of London. Um, you'll notice that we are, in some sense, gaming the system. Not only are we choosing users that are likely to divide, we're choosing applications where you're likely to want to divide as well. Okay? And we realize that up front. Basically, if we can't get the optimal users to divide for the optimal situations, then we can give up and go home now. Okay? If it works for the average users as well as the ideal cases, then that's sort of icing on the cake, at least for the initial stages. So we told users they were going to be dividing these interfaces in three different environments. So a public environment, which we said was the lobby of a building. A semi-private environment, which was sort of a shared work lab, where there were other people around, but they were your colleagues. And then a private environment that was your personal office, where you could close the door and you could be the only one seeing that information. 
And we told users they had three devices available. They had their mobile phones, they had a desktop computer, and they had a projected display. And the way we asked people to describe how they might want to allocate the interfaces for these applications, for these tasks, was to give them a bunch of paper copies of the interfaces. So we took a whole bunch of screen snapshots, made multiple copies of each, and then we pulled out our scissors and our post-it glue and cut them up into little pieces and slapped the glue on the back. And so when people came to a particular task, the way they described the interface was they took the pieces that they wanted and they laid them out into three pieces of paper that were sized for the desktop, sized for the projector, and sized for the cell phone. Okay? Um, and so, for example, if you wanted to do the purchase application, you could put this information on the desktop and then say, well, this is the stuff they want to view on my phone because it's the credit card part. I'm more concerned about people seeing that information. Uh, people could describe the allocation of components. They could also describe how they might want to modify the content and the behavior of those components. Um, so obviously, tough to support behavior changes with paper, but we did provide a couple components to help describe content changes. Yeah. So a simple example for the calendar, we gave you a little busy slides that you could slide over the event details if you wanted to talk about obfuscating the details of your meetings when showing that on a display other people could see. Okay. Uh, so the study method, we counterbalanced the presentation of environments across users. We also randomized the task order across users. The basic idea here was we were trying to avoid a particular ordering that might induce extra paranoia. So if we showed you the, the public stuff first, would you then be more paranoid in private? Okay, so in theory, by counterbalancing that stuff, we can try and balance out the paranoia-inducing effects in different environments and also different tasks. Uh, we did a talk log. We asked people to talk log while they were assembling these components. We would occasionally interrupt and ask questions as well. We videotaped all the sessions to avoid you know, the poor grad students writing their poor hands off and missing some of the details. Um, and we focused the analysis on what decisions people made, what divisions they made, as well as why they made them. Okay, and my initial disclaimer before talking about results. We fully realize this is exploratory. We know that people have a hard time speculating for future applications of technology. The idea behind this is trying to motivate the additional work as well as to provide direction for it. Okay. So take these things with a grain of salt, but we think there is enough here to actually provide some direction going forward. So high level results. High level, highest one for us was that people actually are interested in dividing. Okay. Of our 18 users, 17 actually did divide interfaces at least once. And in fact, 14 of the 18 actually divided in over half of the situations, where a situation is a task, comma, environment. Uh, second bit, which is the computer scientist surprised us a little bit, people are more concerned about the onlookers seeing their private information than they are worried about the devices in the loop. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But all the users mentioned privacy. <coughs> 15 of them worried just specifically about onlookers. And six of them mentioned worrying about the devices compromising the information. Other bits. It turns out that one size does not fit all. The sorts of divisions that users talked about making varied both by users. So users are idiosyncratic here. It also varied by the environment. So obviously people made different divisions in public environments than they did in private environments. Uh, and if you look at the types of divisions that people made, they actually tended to fall in the lines that we expected. So in private environments, people divided to do focus plus context or to avoid screen clutter. They essentially did the multiple monitor thing and divided information across multiple devices to avoid overlapping windows. In semi-private environments, they did those things too, but they also added sharing. I want to move this counter to this projected display so that my colleagues can see when I'm busy and when I'm free. In public environments, people did what we expected. They actually divided to improve the UI, to take advantage of a larger display, to take advantage of a keyboard for input, and they also moved information around to address concerns they had about privacy or security. Some more detailed stuff. Uh, it turns out that people actually did do both component allocation, modifying content, as well as modifying behavior. We actually hadn't mentioned that this much to people, but actually a number of them came up with it on their own, different ways of changing the behavior of components when they were on different devices. So almost everyone moved components around. 13 out of, of 18 did modify content as well. And then 7 out of the 18 did modify the behaviors of those components on different devices. Um, this one actually surprises us a little bit as well. So we expected that lots of people would divide in the public environment. We were surprised by how much people also divided in the semi-private and private environments. So even when you're in your office and you're not worried about onlookers, people still want to take advantage of the different devices that were available to them. Um, we pushed on people for reasons for dividing. The top stuff is sort of, of input reasons. So if you're going to enter lots of text, you're going to divide your interface so you can get the best input device available. Uh, if you're viewing lots of stuff, you want a large display. Um, I was actually surprised by how much of a pet peeve scrolling is with people. Um, not only to avoid vertical, but like horizontal scrolling was the kiss of death for an interface. If you made them horizontally scroll, it was, you know, uh, 
Um, privacy was a big one. Everyone mentioned it. Again, most people focused more on onlookers than they did about devices. And then sharing and monitoring, other uses that uh, um, sort of came up commonly as reasons for division. Um, I want to focus a little bit more on this one because we were sort of surprised by this. Uh, so just sort of make sure we're all on the same page. The basic issue here is that you are fundamentally reliant on your input and output resources to report what you're doing to your computer and to report back what your computer is doing to you. Okay. Now, in most cases, this isn't a problem. I don't stay up late at night worrying about whether my monitor is correctly showing what's on my computer. Okay. But as soon as you bring a public device into the loop, that device can capture all the information flowing through it, both from you to another device, like your passwords, and stuff coming back to you, like if you're reading email, webmail on a device that's not yours. It can modify that information coming through. And it can also impersonate you. It can actually essentially execute commands on your behalf. So you know, if there's a Microsoft employee with a sense of humor, they can modify the computer in the front lobby, such that when I log into my Gmail account, it sends mail to George Bush at whitehouse.gov saying, you know, nice policy, jackass. Um, and so you have to worry about these sorts of things when working with a public device. And so when people sort of talked about, yeah, we're not really concerned about devices, we're concerned about onlookers, our response was sort of, really? I mean, really? Um, so we did a quick follow-up study where we designed an online questionnaire, and we sort of looked at more people in a broader cross-section of people. So we grabbed 28 users, this time ranging from 20s through 60s. Uh, we grabbed six students, we got 22 professionals for this. And then we asked them questions based on accessing email, a calendar, and then purchasing things using a public device. So we're not talking about division here, we're just talking about using a public computer to accomplish these tasks. For each of them, we asked people to, to list the risks they perceived and then to rate the severity of them. And then we gave them a bunch of risks we had come up with and asked them to rate the severity of those. So the high-level result is no. People don't actually worry that much about what devices can do. So the numbers here, we asked people on a scale of 0 to 5 where 1 was not very worried, 5 was I'm extremely concerned, and 0 was I don't think that's possible. Um, so red is more concerned, and the light yellow is sort of not concerned at all. Um, average across all of them is 2.5. So we, we put up this graph, and then we were like, man, there seems like some people are more concerned than others. And we were like, it must be tied to computer experience, because you know, obviously the more you know about computers, the more paranoid you are, right? Uh, so we did that, and it turns out that that wasn't it. And then we sorted them again, and it turns out that it looks like it's correlated with age. And so it wasn't an effect that we had anticipated. So we don't have enough people across the different age groups to actually do the statistical results. But I think it's interesting enough to sort of follow up on in the future to figure out why are old people paranoid. Um, it's possible that old people just are paranoid. I would suggest you not frame your research question with exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's fun to phrase it that way for talk. So you know. um, I've also seen some research suggesting that I mean, obviously, old people tend to have more money, and so they have more to lose. Um, there's also possibly factors tied into here that old people just don't trust devices because you know they're strange and unfamiliar, and, and you know, it's not like your kids who grew up in the Nintendo. So I think it's interesting to push on for, for a future question, but we don't have enough data now to sort of say for sure that there is a strict correlation here with age. Older people are also more experienced, and therefore probably gotten burned by. This is also the, they've learned the world is not a happy fuzzy place, and so it could actually be a realistic appraisal of you know what could possibly go wrong. Um, actually, the other thing I should point out here is. If you notice, there are also a couple of things that sort of pop out people are more concerned at. Those tend to fall into things that are prominent in the media. So you worry about your credit card number. You worry about things like your address information. Okay. So if it appears in the media a lot, people are more concerned about it. Okay, so what sort of lessons did we draw from, from that study? Um, first one was, since people actually did take advantage of these different ways of dividing and changing components, it looks like if you want to really support people when dividing, allow them to affect the component allocation, the content of those components, and the behavior of those components. When people divide, so I sort of said that one size doesn't fit all, and there was actually a variation among users and environments. There did tend to sort of be some common cases that we saw and then some minor deviations from those. So it looks like a good solution might be to provide some common choices that came up and then allow modification for the individuals if they care that much, they want to make some more additional changes. Um, they're sort of the, since people aren't concerned about devices, and they actually are a huge theoretical risk, one of the issues is going to be to communicate the effects and consequences of choices. Here are the possible divisions that you can make. What are the things that might happen if you choose this one particular division? Uh, one of the things that comes out of actually both theory as well as what people actually did. Obviously, it's, it's going to be problematic for effectiveness if you make people keep switching their focus between devices. OK? 
Okay? And we actually saw people sort of arranging the interfaces to avoid that need. They tried to design the divisions such that they could sort of focus on one for a while, focus on another for a little bit of period, and then switch back. There wasn't a lot of sort of rapid back and forth. Um, one of the ways we saw people dealing that with that was sort of uh, mirroring interfaces across devices, had the information appear in both places. We also saw, instead of division in some cases, lightweight transfers. So I might start out the web browser purchase on my desktop. When it comes to the credit card part, quickly move it to my cell phone, push that information in, and then push that interface back, rather than worrying about setting up a division of those interfaces between those two devices. And so it looks like it's going to be a, a good idea to provide lightweight support for those types of actions as well. Um, and a final one is that people are going to trust these devices too much. And so we have to make sure we provide mechanisms to essentially protect users from themselves. OK, so you know, being computer scientists, we couldn't resist building stuff as well. And so we sort of sat around thinking, OK, if we're going to build a framework to support building these sorts of applications, what are the lessons that we can draw mean for the requirements for that sort of support? Shoot, Ed. You, you've mentioned a couple of times the behavior of components of the different, um, mm -hmm. they were spontaneously saying the behavior of the components was changing. Can you give me some examples of the kinds of things that we're doing? Uh, I'll give you two quick ones. So one of them was for um, the email application. If you are composing a new message on a device that is not yours, um, one of the greatest advancements in email in the last couple of years, at least for me, has been address completion. So I start typing in ed space, and it goes, oh, Ed Cottrell, and fills that in for me. Um, there's a sort of potential risk for privacy there, where I go to a public computer, and I type in ed, and it goes, talks to my device, and says, what do you got for A? What do you got for B? What do you got for C? And it just like, grabs all my contacts. And so you can modify the behavior of that component such that I get address completion on my devices, but not on the public device. Um, there are some intermediate points as well, but that's one example. Um, the other one we saw was um, this notion of temporal obfuscation. So I'm filling out an expense report, and I'm putting in the numbers. Um, I'm worried about onlookers, but I'm going to presume that at any given point in time, someone may not be paying attention. And so I want to fill in that field with the number, but as soon as I tab to the next one, I want it to go to all asterisks. Um, you see that in things like contact information as well. I want to type the address, but once I'm gone from that field, turn it into to asterisks instead. Um, so those are some of the common, common ones we saw. Uh, OK, so if you're going to actually build these applications, what sort of framework support do you want for them? We came up with a couple of initial requirements to play with. One of them, again, was tied into this notion of supporting different types of divisions and allowing users to affect that. Okay, so not just putting this all in the developer saying it's up to you to figure out which ones, but allowing the users to steer that at runtime so they can affect the particular one that was going to happen. The other one was tied into providing translucency. So given the users are likely to trust these devices too much, how do we give you the Ronald Reagan arms disarmament approach of trust but verify? Okay. Secondary requirements were sort of not tied into the design lessons so much as if it's lightweight and you minimize the infrastructure required, you can allow people to annex more devices. Okay. The smaller the footprint, the more devices you can bring in. And then flexible and extensible was, OK, we know we're gonna, not going to get it right in the first try. So let's try and build it so we can make changes in the future once we figure out eventually how to get it right. Make mistakes early and often. So the general approach we came up with was instead of describing the interface itself, what you do is you describe a template that describes the interface in more general terms. So you describe the, the interface that people can interact with, and in particular, the choices that the users can make. So you describe the choices for where components can go, what the content of those components can be, and what the behaviors can be. Okay. So a fine line here between sort of, of giving the developer too much responsibility and ending up with full end user programming. And one of the big ones is in behaviors. It's a lot easier to allow users to tweak where components go. Tweaking the behaviors is much more difficult. And to sort of instantiate that approach, we came up with uh, something that my PhD student, Heather <coughs> Hutchings, came up with called Term Diamond. Okay, so a framework for dividing interfaces across multiple opportunistically annexed devices. She worked for a while to come up with that one. She's kind of uh, And the basic idea is you have a number of modules in the framework that support developing an application with a divisible interface. There are a couple parts that a, designer prov a developer provides for each application. The big core one is the model. So if you think of MVC, we're actually doing some minor variations on that across devices. So the developer provides the model, which gives you your data management and your behaviors. They also give you a number of templates for the interfaces that are stuck into a multiple application template library. They can also draw on templates that the framework provides itself. So for example, we provide some templates for common dialog boxes that the developer can draw on. Uh, at runtime, the application relies on something that we term the XDL composer. And I'll explain about what XDL is in a second. But the basic idea is it takes the templates that are provided and then at runtime instantiates them into a detailed interface description that you can basically go, well, OK, there's a button here, and there's a text box here, and the contents of it should be this. 
So to make that work, we're essentially relying on two XML-based languages. One of them, XDL, is essentially an interface description language. So I think same sort of class as XUL, XIML. Uh, what are you guys? XAML, UIML, pick your favorite variant. The big thing we're doing is we're tacking on a location attribute on top of that to describe where that concrete description goes when you show it to the user. The other one we're using is a template description language. Okay, so it describes the interface and essentially tells you how to conditionally assemble that XDL description at runtime. So it allows the developer to, to describe what the choices are the user can make. It allows them to describe where they should pull data from the model to fill in that interface. And it allows them to actually describe the conditions that affect what goes where. Okay? There's also some loop stuff for repetitive assembly. So if you're assembling an inbox, for example, you actually really need a loop to keep pulling the message data and sticking on the additional rows in the table. Um, the XTL composer can talk directly to the template library, primarily for efficiency reasons. Um, but the other modules end up communicating through a tuple space. So this ties into what we're doing for flexibility. We're doing loose coupling among our modules so that when we make a mistake, we can easily swap something else in its place. Um, devices actually do communication across each other. It's not a shared tuple space. They're actually two separate tuple spaces. And applications figure out what they should pass back and forth based on the current division the user has chosen. Okay. So information does not just leak randomly from device to device because that would sort of uh, you know, ruin the whole point of dividing the interface in the first place. Uh, and then the interface interpreter is responsible for taking that interface description and coming up with a concrete interface they can show to the user. Okay. And obviously, you know, the interface interpreter can be different on different platforms. So you can throw in here you know, Windows Forms, you can throw in Swing components, you can throw in HTML. Any way you actually want to convert that description to an interface, you can show people. Uh, the monitor is what we're doing to provide some of that translucency. Okay, the monitor can actually sit there and watch all the information going through the tuple space. It can actually pull out and interrupt communication as well. So it can grab a, a tuple and avoid putting it back in until the user takes some action. So the ways we've played with a lot of the user to sort of get that translucency is, well, we can do the obvious thing. We can visualize information flow. Uh, and it's actually a fun trick to try and convert the tuples to readable English. Um, you can actually require opt-in for some stuff. So if you compose a new message on a public device, when it go ba goes back to your cell phone, you can require that the user look through it and approve it explicitly saying, yes, it's OK, before it actually gets sent on. Um, you can also set up some, right now we're doing heuristics to warn of inappropriate activity. There have been 10 accesses to your address book in the last 10 seconds, so you're sure the device you're using is actually kosher. Um, I collaborate with someone from machine learning, and in theory, you can sort of build models of usual and unusual activity as well. We haven't taken that step yet. OK, so how are we doing on the requirements so far? So what we're doing to allow the users to sort of affect the divisions at runtime is this approach based on conditionally assembled interfaces drawing on templates. Okay. For our translucency, right now we're relying on a monitor. For our later requirements, basically all you have to do to participate in annexing now is be able to connect to some sort of connection. Okay, wireless, wired, you've got to have some way to get data between the two devices. You have to be able to parse that XML description of the interface and then create something you can show to the users from it. Okay, so relatively lightweight requirements. For flexibility, right now we're getting that through a combination of our XML languages, which are easily extensible, as well as the tuple space, which gives us that loose coupling between the modules that are involved. So we've whipped up a couple of example applications with this just to sort of play around in the space. Um, one of them is actually an email application that allows you to read messages just on one device. So you can take your inbox, you can move it between devices. You can take messages and move them independently between devices. So I can look through my inbox, figure out one they don't care about people seeing, move just that, that uh, email over. Um, you can also divide message windows as well. So you can pull off, for example, the headers, keep those on your personal device, and just move the body over. So you can try and keep the device from grabbing the context that might be contained in the message. Um, you can also do things like play with the contents. You can search for things like URLs and email addresses and strip those off as well. Uh, we built a simple calendar that allows you to view different time scales on different devices. So you might want to have a week view that your colleagues can see in a large projector, but just look at a day view on your device. And you can also do things like modify content so that your colleagues see you when you're busy, but you know, not that that 12 o'clock meeting is really you napping in your office. Very important when you have a dean that you can claim that you're busy without revealing what you're busy doing. Uh, we whipped the drawing application as well. So this actually allows you to sort of zoom in on an image here and modify some of the details while sort of getting an overview of what the impact of those changes is. OK, so the research we've done so far actually suggests that this is a, something potentially valuable to users, and it gives some sort of directions for future research. The questions that I particularly think are, are interesting here are, 
first of all, how do we get people to understand the potential and actual impact of their choices? Okay. Right now, obviously, using public devices is not a big risk because folks aren't doing it in mass yet. If we actually give people the capability to divide their interfaces across personal devices and public devices, if I were a hacker, and I occasionally think about funding my research by turning evil, um, that's where I would be shooting because I could do all sorts of fun corporate espionage by assuming that people will trust the public devices too much. I'd probably go into business. I'd actually provide the devices as well as capture the information on them. Heck with hacking, that's too much work. Um, and then there's the question of, okay, people, once people make a division, how do you communicate what is actually going on between those two devices? This is actually a problem, not just in sort of dividing across devices, but in devices in general. I, in most cases, have no idea what my laptop is doing. I'm always sort of looking through the process table trying to figure out why you know, something is running so slow today. Um, if we're going to make sort of devices more translucent, both individual devices and communication across them, there's this big question of how do we do that most effectively? I'm sure users don't actually want to spend all their time monitoring the flow of information between devices. So where's the sweet spot of provide enough awareness of what's going on without requiring constant monitoring? Um, here's an interesting one. If you're going to build these things, how do you let developers do it? Okay, this doesn't really fit into the model of Visual Basic anymore since we're talking about sort of having cut lines for your interfaces. It'd be interesting to see what the right method is to support developers. Uh, and last one, I mean, there's some folks, including Ken, who've been playing with some neat mechanisms in the front end, which is how do you get these devices connected and talk to each other in the first place? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to quickly mention some of the other stuff we're doing in personal information environments as well before letting you guys go. Uh, so I'll mention three quickly. One is sort of using portable computers as access points to other devices. One is supporting routine decision making. And the last one is supporting task-based interaction across devices. So the, the um, using portable computers as access points, the general idea here is we're focusing on something that we call Serendipus File Exchange. So Serifay is the acronym we came up with for the system, which in case you're curious is Cheers in Turkish. Um, <laughs> you learn the greatest strange things in research. So the basic idea here is, you know, I bump into Ken at a conference, and I'm like, oh, I'm working on this paper. You should really take out a, a copy of it. You know, it's on my laptop. I don't have it handy, but, uh, you know, when I get back to my hotel room, I'll, I'll send you a copy of it. Um, if instead all my devices know each other, what I can do is I can pull up my cell phone, which is the device most likely to be with us, which is why we're focusing on portable devices as the access points. I can pull up my phone. I can type in Serifé, and it'll actually query each of my other devices that it knows about and say, what do you guys have that matches this? When they return the list of results, I can say, okay, that's the one I want. Send that to Ken. And I'll go, what's your cell phone number? And I'll punch it into my device, and I'm done. I put my phone away. And a couple of seconds, Ken phones rings, and he says, oh, I've got a file coming in from Jeff. Yeah, I just send that to my desktop. I'll read it when I have time. And he closes his phone, and we can continue our conversation. Behind the scenes, our devices will exchange those files for us. Um, basically, the trick that we're playing is we're layering on top of an instant messaging network. We're giving each of our devices an IM ID, which gets around issues like DHCP, because actually none of my six devices has a permanent IP address. But the IM server essentially acts as a name server to link um, IM IDs and IP addresses. It also gets around things like incoming firewalls, since my device is open at the connections to the server as opposed to the other way around. Uh, if you have an outgoing firewall, you're screwed, but that's a different problem. Um, so we played with that. We actually showed that off at Mobile ACI this year. The supporting routine decision making was a student playing with the idea of, you know, what if something like my alarm clock was part of my personal devices as well? Uh, and the space we started playing with was, we were going to do the intelligent alarm clock, you know, set your alarm time for you, because that's more than vaguely silly. Uh, instead, what we did was trying to build up a model of what was usual and unusual with traffic, weather, and your schedule. And it was sort of highlight unusual conditions so that you could make better decisions. This is sort of the, you know, 80% of the time, today's weather is like yesterday's weather, so you can just dress up for today like you did yesterday. But occasionally, you get screwed doing that, particularly in Atlanta in the spring and fall where the weather fluctuates wildly. Uh, and so it was sort of highlight unusual stuff and let you make a better decision at the point where we were going to make it anyway. The supporting task-based interaction was we actually had a student interested in essentially generating better remote controls for interaction across multiple consumer electronics devices. And the idea he was playing with was rather than having remotes that are designed on access to functionality, which is the way remotes are designed now, come up with remotes that are based on the tasks that you perform with those devices. And it turns out that you can throw a little bit of machine learning at this and cluster the sort of buttons that occur together. And you really want to get the user involved as well, because it turns out that the machine learning needs a lot of data before it can get good results. Uh, and so there's sort of a sweet spot in the middle between getting the, the, the device involved and getting the user involved and coming up with a nice remote that is task-based, not functionality-based. OK, so to summarize now in two slides, 
Um, we're really sort of in the midst of this transition away from working with a single personal computer and moving toward this idea of interacting across multiple devices. Okay? So more and more people are working with a combination of desktops and tablets and PDAs and cell phones. The opportunity and the challenge that we have is to sort of, of combine those devices such that instead of interacting with them separately, I can interact across them in a much smoother fashion. For purchasing and exiting in particular, um, our research does suggest that there actually is potentially some value here. Users actually are interested. And it suggests that there are a number of directions that we can go in for future research. Okay. We've taken some initial steps with Diamond with a framework that we can use to start exploring this design space more efficiently. Okay, but there's a whole bunch of stuff left to be done. And with that, I would be happy to take questions. Um, any thoughts on looking at device capabilities when you go to divide up? So um, one of the things I didn't mention at all, uh, you got a whiteboard, sorry. My faculty instincts will kick in. I talked about this as between the developer and the user for specifying a division. It's actually a triangle. It actually involves the developer, the systems that are involved in the user. And so there's been some work sort of along This is why when I George Tech, I always ah, travel with my own whiteboard markers. Actually, there's been some work looking at this space here. Okay, So right now, instead of developers fully specifying stuff, a lot of the early model-based stuff was let the systems themselves come up with it, given some general description. So people have played along this space here. Some of the end user programming starts to draw this up as well. Okay, So we've been mainly sort of pushing along this axis right now. But given the devices involved, I mean, I know that if there's a desktop and a phone available, there's no point in me showing the divisions for the large display because you're not likely to use them. And so you can do both some sort of upfront, narrow down the set of choices that you're likely to take advantage of. Actually, not just the devices, but if I know something about the environment as well. If I know it's a private environment for you versus a public environment, then I can also, again, narrow down the set of things you're likely to do. Um, you can also do some, essentially, a uh, little smart stuff on the device side. So for example, if I pass you a description of an interface and I think you're a desktop, but in practice you're you know, some variant of desktop that I've never heard of before, you can actually take that description and do some smart processing with it to try and customize the description I give you to your particular capabilities. Um, but that's sort of, you know, wave our hands, future work, interesting area kind of thing. Yeah? Are you planning on, or do you do this already, remembering sort of, oh, last time AJ came to a big device, she threw this up there, probably she'll want to do it again when she sees Talked about it, haven't gotten to it yet. But yeah, that's a that's an obvious step to take. With sort of uh, you know, instead of having amnesia, basically say, oh, you know, the last ten times you did this, you did this. So I'm going to presume you might do that again, or even trying to build up, you know, in addition to particular devices, you could think about sort of classes of devices as well, and all sorts of fun stuff there. Um, you covered really lightly. Um, I have all sorts of anecdotes. I'm trying to figure out which ones are the fun ones. Um, one of the ones that I actually like is that people don't like scrolling. Um, what are the things have I got? Uh, I'll give you some examples. I mean, so I mentioned that like one size doesn't fit all. Let me see if I can come up with some fast examples of types of divisions we did see. Um, and I'll use email because that's the one <coughs> I've had the most discussions with the student on. Um, so obvious sorts of things you can do here. You can transfer the inbox. And actually, the, uh, um, the one person we saw that didn't divide at all sort of fell into the category of, yeah, too much hassle. I'm sure devices are fine. I'm just going to always use the desktop. And in fact, one of the, the, uh, um, if you sort of look at the way people use different devices, um, one of the things you find is that um, the desktop is comfortable. And actually, people use this word. The desktop is comfortable, so I'm going to put this component there. And it's sort of the, that's one of the reasons you sort of have to take these results with an asterisk because we're asking people to speculate. There's sort of the, you know, desktop is mama. It's the thing we're most familiar with, and so we go to that thing by default. Um, so transfer marks between devices. Um, we saw, let's 
move messages around. And this was a, um, a lot of this was sort of to combat the, you know, don't want folks sitting next to you to see your porn spam. Um, the other one of this was, you know, you work for a company, you have some sensitive information, you really don't want folks around you reading those emails. Um, where you really got it idiosyncratic was when you got into dividing stuff. Um, so there was a class of people that were just like, eh, I just ripped the headers off, that's fine. You know, as long as they can't see who I'm emailing, then I presume that that's sufficient privacy. Um, you got folks that were um, much more about sort of the content. Contact info, uh, company names, uh, anything that had to do with dollar signs. Made people very nervous with other people seeing as well. Um, so yeah. that you mean people would like, they don't want to show like the context, like the three or four words they were editing and not the rest of the message? Or? So what it typically thought as you wanted to see the whole body of the mail and then replace part with like, you know, big X's or something. Um, so it was just sort of uh, uh, hide individual pieces. Um, actually, I didn't mention this at all, but not only do we see people sort of dividing for privacy, so don't show messages that were, you know, things I'd be concerned with other people seeing. You also do get people that talk about, I would choose particular messages to project an image of myself. So, you know, when I was uh, looking at my web browser in the, the Starbucks, I'd be, you know, if I was doing the BMW website, that'd be on the large public display. And goes, Dude, BMW. Um, but, you know, if you were setting up the doctor's appointment, then you know, that'd be small and private because, you know, I don't want folks knowing I'm seeing my doctor. Um, so there was some, um, not just in public, but also in the semi-private environments as well. Um, and it, there was some fun, um, like the expense report. There's this interesting division among different types of users, some of whom are like, I really don't want my colleagues knowing how much I'm spending on, on, on dinners. So the folks like, yeah, you know, let them see how much I'm spending. I'm eating at the classy restaurants. So do, do, do you talk lots, for instance, about the privacy case that people divide because they want to keep some information more private or because mm -hmm. they want to have more information public, like the BMW example? Um, do you, did you find that people did their splits based on things that they thought one device or the other would all would know about the world? And, oh, welcome to the desktop kiosk, Mr. Cell Phone Toting Guy. <laughs> you can tell by the fact that cell phone, you're where it was all day, that your expense report, that you got the receipt for in your pocket, it was probably while you were at a place that we can cross-correlate to a location, to that, that restaurant. No, we actually didn't see that much at all. I mean, the suspicion is that sort of new enough technology that it wasn't sort of on folks' radar. And we did sort of see sort of uh, um, common types of usages. So if you sort of paint with a very broad brush, the phone is stuff, either it is private or if it was fast. So for example, forwarding a message, people would look at that and say, ah, oh, that's not enough keystrokes that I really need to move to the large display. I'll just do it on my phone because it'll be less overhead than worrying about moving it around. Um, large stuff was, a lot of this was monitoring. So if I'm in my office, I might move my inbox to the large display so I can just keep track of if I have new mail while I'm going on with all the tasks. Um, this was sharing, so in the semi-private environments, put my calendar up there. Um, it was fun. And so this is things like, you know, uh, for the trip to London, a lot of times people would take the early steps of that because they wanted folks around them to see that they were going to London and either share stories or, you know, realize they were cool and going to Europe. Um, this was, so the, um, if you sort of look at usage across environment as well, what you basically saw was the large display was used a lot in private, a fair amount in semi-private, almost not at all in public. And if it wasn't public, it was those cases where I want to shape people's perception of me, not I'm going to make myself more efficient. People stopped at the desktop for that one. Um, and this was sort of, you know, this is the comfort one. This is everything else. This is sort of everything, depending on screen real estate, people would occasionally push stuff off, but it was sort of the default go-to. If I'm not sure where to stick it, I stick it on the desktop. Yeah? How does this correlate with you know, real behavior? If you wander around labs where there really are big screens up, and you see people doing stuff with them. Do people like, have you happened to notice whether people tend to be very careful if not putting up their email on a very big screen? Um, I'll give you two answers to that. One is that I don't see people actually using large displays in practice, uh, with a couple of exceptions. And the folks that I know who do do it don't read the email on the large display because they're too concerned about someone wandering in their office and seeing their email. Uh, so I have like one or two data points, which is not enough for me to generalize really well. I can generalize very well that people don't use them very much, but that doesn't get at your question. Uh, 